All right, Parsha 101, here we go. Well, this week is actually a special week because it's Shabbos, Hanukkah, and Rosh Chodesh, which is the beginning of a new month. So this week, which is very unusual, we actually take out three Torahs uh, for the three events that are aligning. And one for each Torah reading. So what we'll do here is I'll leave one voice note, we'll have the Parsha of the week, and the other one we'll have, we'll go through the the readings for Hanukkah and Rosh Chodesh, which should actually be kind of quick. So here we go. This week's Torah portion is called Parshas Miketz. It's called Miketz, and it comes from the verse, first verse of the of the portion. Yamin. It was at the end of two years, and Pharaoh had a dream. So last Parsha ended off with Yosef. Joseph was stuck in prison. He told the cupbearer after he interpreted his dream, "May hey, remember me, right?" And God's like. We don't rely on people, so you'll stay here a little bit longer than intended. So two years, Yosef was stuck there until Paro Farino had this dream. And if you're thinking, well, wow, dreams, dreams, interesting. Joseph had dreams. Um, Paro Farino's having dreams now. There is a connection because Joseph being like such an eminent, preeminent figure of the generation, he did set a tone as in it does mirror the fact that he had a dream. And so kind of set the tone that these dreams of the future would occur also for other large events that were going to occur. Um, which just goes to show the impact a Jewish person's actions can have on the world and uh, how far reaching they can be. Kind of like how we can set the tone for good or God forbid not good uh, within the world. Anyway, getting to the story. So Pharaoh has a dream. He has two dreams back to back. Dream number one is that there's he's standing on the, the shores of the Nile River and seven fat cows emerge and all of a sudden there's seven... seven very scrawny cows come out, emerge, and they're standing by his side, and all of a sudden the seven scrawny cows eat up the, the fat cows, and they don't. They do, there's no change that comes over them, and that's the first dream. The second dream is he's standing by the Nile River, and there's, se there's seven healthy ears of grain that spread out, and there's seven um, very gaunt-looking grains that come up, and they somehow swallow up the seven healthy grains, and, and that's the end of the second dream. So when he wakes, he's like, okay, this is telling me something is going on here. Something's going to happen. Now, he, he calls in all the great dream interpreters, and it's not that they couldn't figure, they knew that there was something going on here. They said, you know, this, the Nile sustains Egypt. Um, the healthy, you know, the healthy is probably something to do with plenty. The uh, gauntness probably has to do with famine, but they couldn't figure out as why they existed at the same time. They couldn't figure out how, like, you can't have both. At this, so then they started coming up with other interpretations like oh you'll have seven daughters and maybe you'll bury seven other daughters and pharaoh's like no like pharaoh like it, it didn't make sense to him he's like i'm not just gonna be having these dreams about sending up the nile or whatever some some personal thing there's something you know something that's gonna affect my peoples so that's why now he's looking for someone to interpret his dreams and that's all someone the cupbearer wakes up is like oh yeah there's this guy joseph you know in the prison who interprets dreams all right get him in here so he calls, Yosef finally gets pulled out of the prison and they clean him up and he comes and Pharaoh's like, you know, I heard, I, I heard you interpret dreams. And it's like, you know, God will provide the answer. And um, so he tells over the dreams and Yosef says, okay, the fact that you've got these dreams back to back, it means that, you know, this is going to happen. This is not some vague vision of the future, but it's something that God's about to put this into motion. And what what's going to be, you're going to have seven years of, of mass a mass abundance so much so much and it's going to be followed by seven years of so much not of leanness and famine and terrible famine and you saw it side by side these things occurring because during the seven years of, of abundance and muchness you got to prepare for the seven years of famine so this made a lot of sense to Pharaoh. He, he he agreed with his dream interpre interpretation and yosef tells him you know appoint someone and he'll you'll set up um, warehouses and you'll gather and you'll prepare for the seven years of them that are to come. To which Pharaoh immediately he removed his signet ring, and um, and he took off the gold. He gave Joseph the uh, gold chain of office, and he basically appoints him vice. He says, "I give you the entire Egypt. The only thing I am the only one who are, who's who is above you. Like no one else. You you got control of everything, and um, like no man can lift hand or foot without your say so." Um, but as a side thing, they also say that jo Joseph, Joseph during that time, the angel Gabriel taught him all 70 languages of the world. And um, so Pharaoh kind of tested him in different languages. And then 
Yosef said something to Pharaoh in Hebrew, and Pharaoh didn't know Hebrew, so he couldn't respond. And so he kind of like swore him to secrecy, like, don't tell anyone you know Hebrew, that I don't know Hebrew, because then they'll want, you know, then you should really be in my place. And Joseph was like, okay, I'll take it. Anyways, at that point, Joseph is 30 years old. Remember, he got sold when he was 17. And now, so this is now 13, 13 years later, he's now 30 years old. And um, Pharaoh also gives him a name called Tzafnas Panech, and he gives him a wife, um, Asnat Bas Potiphera. Potiphera is actually Potiphar. They say that it's called Potiphera because it's kind of like a degrading name because um, that he originally got Joseph. He was kind of um, lusting after him, I guess you could say. Um, anyways, so the years of plenty come and there's there's they start collecting and there's just so much like you, they can't even count it. There's, they just lose track of, of inventory. There's so much. And one of the things that Yosef did is that as he collected it all, uh, he put it also, he put all the grains and stuff away with, with, with some of the soil that it grew in, because that would maintain the, the flavor, you know, the, you know, the way that like wine tasters, you know, like what's weird, what is the region this grew in? So, because the soil affects the flavor of things. So he, he packed away also these grains and these plants or however they packed it away with the soils that they were grown in, um, to maintain that. Now, during this time, he also has two sons, uh, Menasha, which comes from um, cause to forget that God has caused me, you know, with my new elevation, God has caused me to forget my past hardships, and also kind of like as a warning to himself that I should never forget uh, my father's home, like where he came from. Um, he has another sign, Ephraim, which comes from the word, you could see it more in, in the Hebrew, the word um, pre is in there, fruit, that he's become fruitful in the land of his suffering. Now, both of his sons were born during the years of plenty, and when the years of famine were coming, Yosef specifically chose not to have, um, not to continue having children. Because that is a time of famine. God is not, uh, I guess you say, producing in the land. It's not a time for me to keep pr producing. So that's why he only had the two sons. Now, seven years, okay, so seven years go by of plenty, and now the famine sets in the land. And it goes throughout the lands, and, and you know, it's covering Egypt, and it's spreading out from there. Um, all the Egyptians, many Egyptians, had, had gathered grain and had gathered, you know, stores, also wall, the years of plenty were going on. But so either they ran out or all their grain kind of rotted. So basically they ended up, they, they got, they went hungry. They got hungry. And they came, now Yosef is the only one who's got it, who's got anything. And he's the one who's been put in charge. So they come to him and they're like, hey, we need to have food. And Yosef kind of saw, this is part of the commentaries that he saw, that because Para put him in charge of everything, it's almost like he owned now all the people of Egypt. And he went according to a Torah, um, I guess you could say a Torah law, that someone who owns slaves is supposed to, the slaves are supposed to be circumcised. That within a Jewish home, that's the way it's supposed to be. So Yosef said, okay, I'm gonna, I'll give you grain, but you know, now that I'm kind of your owner, well, not, I'm kind of paraphrasing, now I'm kind of your owner, you all have to get circumcised. And the Egyptians were like, no. And they went to complain to, to Pharaoh to say, what's this crazy guy up to? And Pharaoh's like, you know, maybe there was a secret curse that went on with all of your, uh, with all the grain. So let's not mess with Joseph and do whatever he says. So eventually I'll do that. And they, um, and the famine intensifies and that's what they did. That's how they got their grains. Now the famine intensifies, it reaches all the way to the line of Israel or Canaan at that time. Right? So now we cut over to Yaakov, Yaakov and, and his sons. So. Yaakov and his son, they hadn't yet run out of, they still had produce. They still, well, they still had um, some, they, they, they hadn't run out of stuff yet. And the brothers were actually kind of unworried because they're like, oh, God's going to take care of us. Everything's going to be fine. And Yaakov was like, look, this isn't such a great look. Like we still have to go according to like the laws of nature. We can't just be relying on these big miracles to come. You know, he ne wasn't necessarily either worried that God was just going to leave him to starve. So he said, okay, everybody pack up your stuff and get down and go down to Egypt. Now, the brothers kind of want to, you know, go down to Egypt, get us provisions, whatever. The brothers kind of went along with this because they sensed they'll, they'll have a chance now to go look for Joseph and see what happened to him. So, um, it's actually interesting that the language that, that Yaakov uses says redu, which is reish dalad yud, which is a numerical equivalent of 210. So, it's kind of hinting at the 210 years that the Jewish people would be slaves in the land of Egypt, right? Because this is the precursor for that. Now the brothers went and they each entered through a different gate of Egypt, right? They, we're not going to all enter together while going through a different gate. That way we could, you know, 
talk to the natives, see what's going on, see if we can find anything about Joseph. Um, now, the thing though is that because Joseph is the one in charge of everything, they gotta end up, they're gonna end up in front of him to get to get provisions. And they, they come before him and they're all bowing before him and Joseph's looking at them, he immediately recognized them, recognized them. They don't recognize him and Rashi, one of the, the foremost commentator of the Torah, points out because he was sold when he was 17, he was still kind of a little bit of baby. Now he's 30 years old, he's grown a beard, he's a, he's a young, you know, he's an adult, he's a young man now. They kind of look the same from, from when he was sold. He also, and then Yosef also, he, so he kind of treats them like strangers because he's got to feel them out to see like, okay, do they repent for what they've done? You know, are these the same brothers? Have they changed at all? Um, he also pretends like he doesn't know Hebrew and he has an interpreter. Say it's the son of Menashe who was like seven years old at the time. Okay, so he's he's going to be the interpreter for them. And that also helped him because, you know, sometimes the brothers were speaking among, them, among themselves and he could overhear them. They didn't um, think he understood them. Anyway, so they'll come before him and he's like, look at them. He's like, you guys are all spies. You're coming through different gates because you're trying to text for weaknesses and blah. You know, he's hurling these accusations at them. And they're trying to protest. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're all coming. We're looking for our lost brother. You know, and we're all sons of the same father. And basically end up spilling a lot of family information. Um, and he's just adamant. Like, see, I'm telling you, you're all spies. And he keeps saying, like, I swear by the life, by Pharaoh's life, that this and this. And um, also commentaries point out that he's doing that each time he's trying to, like, swear he's 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 swearing falsely like i swear i'm gonna do this and this too or whatever so he swears on pharaoh's life which is like meaningless to him um anyways he tells him okay here's what's gonna happen you gotta go you gotta go you gotta bring your other brother to prove that you're not spies or whatever and he actually um he says he, he's gonna hold he's like he hold he he like i'm gonna send you no know, he tells him yeah and i'm gonna send one brother back and the rest of you are gonna stay here until you know till everything's validated and he holds them for three days and then finally says, okay, only one brother needs to stay and the rest of you could go back. Um, so between themselves, the brothers are like, oh, great. We're all being punished now for Yosef, for what we did to our brother Yosef, which he overhears and he kind of has to you know, turn away because he gets very emotional from it. It says he, he, he wept. Um, anyways, they, they, he, he says, okay, I'm going to take Shimon and the rest of you could go and, uh, you know, come back. Don't dare to come back to me if you're not going to bring your younger brother with you. Now, the reason why he took Shimon is it's it's pretty straightforward. Shimon was, first of all, one of the instigators behind, let's kill the dreamer, you know, let's throw him into the pit. He was the one behind that. And also because if you remember, Shimon and Levi are a very deadly combination because of what they did, the way they wiped out the city of Shechem. So he figured to separate them, right? So that's why he held on to Shimon. Um, so they go back and on the way back, Levy opens up his bag and he sees that the money that they paid for the provisions are there is there and they all get very afraid because they're like oh great now what now they're gonna say that we went and we stole stuff um but there's not you know there's not really anything they could do about it they go home and they tell Yaakov everything that happened and Yaakov's like you're taking all my sons from me what is going on with you people and they're like look it's not our it's not our fault like he, this guy I don't know how he knew he was accusing us and, and all this stuff came out and Reuben says, look, if, you know, you could take my two sons and you could hold them. And if, you know, if anything goes wrong, you could kill them. You know, I'll give you my son's lives. And Yaakov was like, no, like, we don't want to be killing any more people. That's not what we want. So he kind of like just rejects the idea. Okay, you guys are not going back. You'll stay here. And that's it. Now, eventually the famine worsens and they have to go back because they have to, first of all, they have to go get Shimon, who parenthetically, after they all left, um, Joseph um, treated him very well after they left. He like he, he took away you know the handcuffs and he fed him and whatever. But um, eventually they have to go back. They run out of food. They got to go back. And they're like they tell Yaakov. The brothers tell Yaakov like look we can't go back without without Benjamin. We got to bring Benjamin with us to Yosef or he's not gonna look at us. He's not gonna sell us any provisions and then and we need it. Um, so Yaakov is obviously resisting this. It's like no can't you know like, don't take him from me also. All this kind of stuff. And finally, Yehuda says, um, look, you could entrust him with me and you could demand him for me. And if not, I will have sinned, sinned against you all of my days. And he, and he wasn't just meaning, you know, that I'm going to be eternally um, have, sinned, like, have sinned against you like the rest of my life. He was also talking about the world to come. So he was kind of staking his share in the world to come against um, the return of the brother. So with that, Yaakov finally was like... Well, I guess we got no other choice. You got to go. You know, God, take a lot of gifts. Take some bribes with you. 
say like honey and almonds or whatever they took with them and take double the amount of money return the money that that was returned to you and god should have mercy on all of us so the brothers go back down to egypt they come they're brought into yosef's house and he prepares a whole meal for them um they try to return the money and and the, you know the stewards the overseer of the house is like no we don't this must have been some special treasure that your god gave you because we got the money that you paid us for food um and he, and he won't take it from them um then um so then they sit down to eat for the meal and joseph orders them all he like he has his silver goblet and he's like my silver goblet of divination will not tell me you 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 and are you are brothers right and this is your age order so you're gonna sit like this and you and you are brothers so you sit like this and you and you are brothers so you sit like this benjamin here he doesn't have a mother and i don't have a mother so he's gonna sit next to me and also the brothers are looking at this like how does he know that? how does he know all this stuff um now yosef also when he he sees benjamin and he looks at him and he gets he gets kind of emotional. He says, you know, what's up? What's up? How you doing? Um, tell me about yourself. And Benjamin tells him that, you know, he's married and he has 10 sons. And the names of his 10 sons are all connected to his brother, Joseph. Um, there's just, there are different descriptions about the brother that, that he lost, basically. And Joseph gets very overwhelmed from that. And turns, you got to, you got to leave so he can have a good cry. So he comes back in. He's like, all right, you know, let the meal begin. Now, it's actually interesting that you got you got Yosef there, Yosef and his family there. You got the brothers there, and then you got you know, whatever other Egyptians are part of the meal. And each of them were served separately because Yosef is a big man on campus, so he's got to be served first. But then they served the brothers because the brothers were eating meat that the Egyptians wouldn't eat because that was their gods. Then the Egyptians don't want to sit with the Hebrews, so they can't be eating with the brothers. The Egyptians also know that Joseph's a Hebrew, <laughs> even though the brothers don't know this, and so they're not going to eat with him. So everybody's got to eat apparently on their own. Uh, even though they're all at the same meal, they're all being served separately because of that. Anyways, so um, this is also the first time that since the sale of Joseph that they all that the brothers and Joseph drink wine, because that was one of the first things they did after the sale, and since then they've kind of been in a, you know, in regret and repentance mode. So this is the first time they do that because they're all thinking, at least the brothers are thinking like, well, we better go along with this guy because who knows what he could do with uh, to us as the viceroy. Anyways. So Joseph tells the overseer of his estates, you know, give them back, give them tons of food, give them back their money again, and plant my silver goblet in Benjamin's pack. So finally, you know, everything is everything is done, everything's concluded, the brothers leave. And um, as soon as the brothers leave, Joseph sends the overseer after them to say, why did you repay, you know, good with, with, um, with evil? What have you done? And the brothers are looking at him like, we have no idea what you're talking about. You know, we're just, we're just trying to get home. And um, and the overseer is like, oh, okay, well, we'll see about that. And starting from the oldest, because obviously he can't go straight to the, to Benjamin's pack, because that's then it's obviously planted there. He goes by one by one, and he starts going through each each pack until he finds the silver goblin of Benjamin's pack. It's like, and the brothers are like, you know, um, you know, okay, that's it. We're all your slaves. You know, we'll be your slaves to you now, and we're so we don't even know how this happened, and we're all so sorry and whatever. And he's like. Um, no, we don't even need you. I only need Benjamin, right? But they all go back to, they all go back to Egypt. Yosef is waiting for them, and um, and the brothers are, you know, adamant about their innocence. And Joseph is like, look, well, Yehud is actually the one who speaks up, right? Because he's the one who's not responsible for Benjamin. He speaks up, you know, heaven can prove that we're innocent, and you know, we're all just gonna be slaves to you. Um, just let us go. And and Joseph is like, nah, no way. I'm keeping Benjamin here with me, and then dun dun dun, we see what happens next week because Judah is not having it. And we await we await the grand climax, the grand finale, next week's portion. <laughs>